Hi, this is Paul, and it's Rough Draft for Sunday, where I run through the current status of my Sunday sermon. This week on my video channel, I had a chance to talk with a father who um, shared his um, very realistic concerns about his children. He loves his children very much. He has six children, more than I have. I only have five. And talked about a, a country road that he lives on and, you know, an accident he almost had and realization that any of his kids could have been in that car um, instead of him driving when when that near accident took place. And and he's a he doesn't believe in God and just stressed, you know, what can he give his children in a world that he faces and what he faces is real. The age of decay is is not our friend, and all love, as C.S. Lewis noted, in this world ends in death or betrayal. And everything, none of us get out of this world alive. Everything we do at some point or another will break down and decay. And that's a truth that nobody in this world gets away from. Now, the beginning of the Bible very much declares that this is not the Creator's intention for this world, but our own rebellion made it such that we are exiled from the garden. And in a sense, even this exile is an accommodation. Uh, Adam and Eve are not killed for their rebellion. They now have to scratch out a living by the sweat of their brow, and by uh, the frustration of the land and the frustration of the womb, and that's been our condition now in the age of decay. John the Baptist comes on the scene and declares a day of reckoning. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John understands the story, our sad story of one of us in rebellion and the miseries that God's people were suffering in their own home country under the subjugation of the Romans was an expression of their rebellion. Now, what's interesting is that so often throughout history and far beyond just the Jews or the Christians, there's this ubiquitous sense of impending doom that's on many, many people, and that gets expressed in many different ways. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region from of the Jordan, confessing their sins and were baptized by him in the Jordan River. They wanted to escape the impending doom that was coming, and they do so by getting right with God. This is not a, an unusual thing for people when, when they recognize, well, when we recognize how far we've fallen short, how, how much we have not done what we should have done, we want to get right with God. And so they confessed their sins, and then they were baptized in the Jordan River. And we'll talk about baptism in a few minutes. But when they saw, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, these were the religious leaders of the day coming to where he was baptizing. They're watching this and they're wondering. They're the in some ways the some of the, the rulers and the different competing factions for the hearts and minds of the people and for supremacy in the community. He said to them, You brood of vipers. Well, obviously he's got some pretty harsh words for them. He's very much by his clothing wearing the mantle of an Old Testament prophet. You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think and do not say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. Do not use the the Jewish ethnic um, the Jewish ethnic exceptionalism from the Old Covenant as a reason to avoid living out the covenant demands that are in the book of Deuteronomy and clear throughout the Torah. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. 
this is the message of John the Baptist and people responded to his message and they came out of the they came out to the river to be baptized by him and to repent and turn the ways that they had been living and turn back to God I baptize you with water for repentance but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John's message is very clear. Judgment is about to fall, and those who are unprepared to face it will face the consequences for the lives that they have led and their participation in the ongoing rebellion against the true king of the world. And then Jesus shows up. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. And right there, everybody scratches their head. What does Jesus have to repent for? Why would Jesus undergo a baptism of repentance? John himself sees the problem. But John tries to defer to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. John says, I'm the sinner. You're the just one. You should wash me clean. You should baptize me. But you, um, and do you come to me? John appreciates who they are in terms of status and says, oh no, Jesus, you should baptize me. Now, John's expectations here are quite clear. Judgment is fully justified. We long for justice when we feel ourselves the victim, and we locate ourselves on the side of the good, and we presume the, cl the clear vision to judge others. We do long for justice when we see, but do we long for justice when we see that we are guilty? When we own our own guilt, do we long for redemption, and where can we find it? Now, Jesus then replies, let it be so. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. But as one commentator noted, why did Jesus submit to John's baptism? Jesus' answer, in order to fulfill all righteousness, has scarcely canceled further discussion. There has been no dearth of conjectures on the query, and then the commentator begins to list them, and down and down and on and on, all the various theories by what Jesus meant by to fulfill all righteousness and, and to understand what Jesus' baptism means. It's, it's really a very interesting and difficult question when you think it through. Now, many have noted that this term fulfill in the Gospel of Matthew has, uh, we've seen it a few times in the run-up to this story in chapter 1. Um, he took, um, this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophets, chapter 2. And remaining there until the death of Herod, there was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophets. You can begin to see the pattern. Um, then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, again, chapter 2. Then he made his home in a town named Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. And here in chapter 5, um, do not think that I have come to abolish the law, or then later on in chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Chapter 8, this was spoken that um, what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah, to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah, he took our infirmities and bore our diseases. And so this fulfillment is very much seems in line with the the writings of the Hebrew scriptures and what they understand Jesus' role to be. And so therefore, this baptism somehow fits into the past, but might it also fit into the future. What does he mean by righteousness? Now, Dallas Willard in his book about the, the Sermon on the Mount, The Divine Conspiracy, made a connection between righteousness that you find in, in the Gospel of Matthew and Plato's Republic. Its first and thorough systematic treatment within the powers of human reason is found in Plato's Republic, which could be more accurately translated the city. This book is really a study in the human soul and of the condition in which the soul must be in order for human beings to live well and manage to do what is right. 
Dallas Willard is here defining righteousness and noted that righteousness and justice is, well, this is what Plato's Republic is in fact all about. And in order to find out what is just or what is right and what is righteous, Plato decides to blow up the question, says, well, a human being is too small. Let's imagine a human being as a whole city and what would a just city be like? And then Plato, in fact, goes on to roll out his ideas. The condition, well, through Socrates, the condition required is called precisely dikaiosune in the Republic. This is exactly the term that Jesus centers on in his Discourse on the Hill, as we have it in the Greek language. It is usually translated justice in Plato's text, but this is, once again, an unfortunate translation, for dikaiosune is only indirectly related to what we today understand by justice. The best translation of dikaiosune could be a paraphrase, something like, what that is about a person that makes him or her really right or good. So, whereas again and again we see that Jesus has done this or done that, and this has happened and that has happened to fulfill the prophets, in this case, righteousness must be fulfilled. And again, to put those two words together in this story, in, in the context of baptism, begins to strain our minds and ask us, well, well, fulfill whose righteousness? His righteousness? Our righteousness? Righteousness in general? The demand for God's righteousness? For short, we might say true inner goodness. Plato, following Socrates, tries to give a precise and full account of what is true, of what true inner goodness is. And of course, you can read Plato's Republic to, to see what he does. But, but now Jesus says that Jesus must be baptized to fulfill righteousness. Now, we should take a closer look at baptism now because baptism is something that many of us are familiar with. It's been around in the Christian church right from the beginning. But, but the question is, why were rebels baptized? If you look at John's baptism, often characterized as a baptism of repentance, it's quite, it seems quite clear. Baptism usually bears sort of two images around it. Uh, often we look at the image of the washing away of sins, and, and that's quite familiar to us in our culture, but I think the older image of baptism is as a ritualized ordeal. What baptism is, is a trial or a test of the gods. Well, what does that mean? It means that basically the, it's, revel it's revelation by historical outcome. The book of the Bible, which is more flush with ordeals than any other book of the Bible, is the book of Daniel. In fact, in the first six chapters of the book of Daniel, there's ordeals all over the place. Daniel's diet of vegetables and waters rather than food, unclean food, from the king's table is an ordeal. And, and Daniel shows himself to be better and healthier than everyone else. And so, well, God's, God's way is revealed to the king of Babylon. Later, Daniel's three friends will be thrown into the fiery furnace, and they're not even touched, even though the men who threw them in were killed by the fire. But they don't even, Daniel's three friends don't even smell of smoke. That's an ordeal by fire. Later on in the book, Daniel is thrown into the lion's den, and the lions don't hurt him, even though Daniel's accusers later will be thrown into the lion's den, and they don't even hit the bottom before the lions grab them. All of these are examples of ordeals, and what baptism is, is a ritualized ceremonial ordeal by which the repentant person in John's baptism goes beneath the water and comes out sanctified, justified, vindicated by God. Now, some of you might already be connecting this up with what will happen later in Jesus' life. And you can find kind of a, a mocking reference to this by the witch test in Monty Python. But of course, this, this witch test and, and this ordeal was, was a bit of a, well, not really a bit of a joke in the Middle Ages, but a bit of a joke in Monty Python because, well, if she floats, well, then she's, then she's a witch. But of course, the problem is if she sinks, well, then she's dead. And, and in Monty Python, they make this little silly connection between a witch, a duck, and a wood, and they weigh her, and all of these kinds of things. But again, the question is, throwing, in a sense, the person out into 
the gods, the realm of the gods, chaos, nature, water, fire, lions, all of these things, and, and seeing what comes back. Now, the will of God is revealed in the drama. And what we're beginning to see here is a, a look forward to the ordeal of the cross and the vindication that the cross will make and the revelation that the cross will make. But we're seeing a foreshadowing of it here in Jesus' baptism. And this is to fulfill all righteousness. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Notice the pattern. Down into the trial of water, up out of the water, vindicated, justified, seen and revealed as the Son of God. The will of God revealed in the drama of the ordeal. Now we live yet and we begin in a state of misery. The guilty are exiled and we are seen as guilty and we feel guilty. But now what we see here is in fact deliverance that Jesus himself goes through the ordeal, suffers the ordeal for us, takes the sins of the world upon himself, and is revealed to be the Son of God. Now, what does this mean for us? Well, we begin by recognizing, even like the people coming out to John, recognizing which side of the guilty line we are on. And we have lots of company on this side of the line. We don't come to the line bearing our, our moral achievements and arguing for that we're slightly better than others. We recognize we are on the guilty side of the line in need of grace. And then we see that Jesus, to fulfill all righteousness, doesn't bring judgment as John expects, but he comes to bear judgment. John is expecting him to bring judgment. That doesn't mean that judgment isn't coming. It's that the first coming of Jesus, he comes to bear judgment, not to bring it. So how should we live? Well, we should mirror Jesus' righteousness in our lives. Now, you might notice that I almost always end my sermons with misery, deliverance, gratitude. Because this mirroring of Jesus' life is not a qualification. It's, in fact, an expression of gratitude where we now display our gratitude by freely striving for the righteousness that he showed us, not only in his baptism, but through the rest of his life and through the life of the church.